Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely day. So today I'd like to go over an article that showed up in Bloomberg. It says New York's tax code is a working from home nightmare. The patchwork of state income tax rules in the U.S. are a problem for cross-border teleworkers and business travelers. So let's dig into this a little bit. It says most states say non-residents are on the hook for state income taxes only if they're physically working in that state. New York, on the other hand, known for aggressively pursuing non-resident workers' incomes, says if you're based out of a company's New York office, regardless of where you're actually sitting, you're subject to its income tax, a position that it took even during the height of the COVID pandemic when most offices were closed and employees had no choice but to work from home. So let's get this straight. They closed every office in New York State due to shitty Cuomo policy, but they still taxed you as if you had an office open in a state that you were not allowed to have an office in because of Cuomo. They still had to pay taxes to New York that did not allow you to have an office open, even if you were working out of a state that did allow you to have an office open. New York logic. So if you do work remotely a few days a week from your home in, say, New Jersey or Connecticut, or five days a week in a state farther away, the New York tax authorities still want your employer to have New York income tax withheld from your paycheck, as though you were in the New York office for five full days. And for people who say that that's normal, only four other states take an approach similar to New York's in the entire country. It's time they fell in line with how the rest of the country treats taxes when it comes to teleworking. Or, in my opinion, it's time for businesses to say, F off. It's imperative to keep track of where you were and when, especially if you are north of six figures. One wrong move and can, you can get hit with a standardized audit form from New York State asking for the details and potentially face underpayment penalties. And I know that one. I know how that stuff works. And in my opinion, you should fight it all. They can come to you asking for 600K to $1.2 million. And at the end of the day, you may not actually owe anything more than $5,000. They have no problems asking for 100, 200, 1,000 times what you actually owe with a straight face, which is why it is imperative, in my opinion, to have a quality tax attorney and a quality CPA go over all of this with you. Because if you don't, there's a good chance that they are going to fleece you. That is what they are known for and that is what they do. The more serious issue is that neighboring states don't look like they're going to credit this anymore. So let's say that you worked in a different state. You may pay income tax in your home state as well as the state that your company's office is based in. This would result in double taxation. And states used to offer credits, but that may be coming to an end. If you live in a nearby state, such as New Jersey or Connecticut, you'll typically receive tax credits from your home state to prevent you from being double taxed. But it's not always an equal swap depending on your home state's tax rates and how those rates apply to different income levels. And who knows how much longer New Jersey and Connecticut will keep making residents whole. Instead, the states seem to be heading in the wrong direction, making retaliatory moves. Last fall, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy proposed legislation that would mimic New York's. Connecticut already has a similar rule in the books. So enjoy double taxation, Northeast residents. Enjoy being taxed as if you are living and working in two states when you live and work in one. At the end of the day, this is a giant waste of time and it is a very uncertain regulatory environment. One of the things that Eli the computer guy says that I'd like to touch on later is that it's not necessarily about having high taxes or low taxes, high licensing fees or low licensing fees. It's about things being consistent. Businesses look for consistency. They can adapt to virtually any environment, but they need consistency. This here is a waste of time to try and figure out. New York style tax policies can also be a drag on business travel. And as anybody who lives in New York City knows, a big part of the commerce in the state, a big part of the economy of the state is people traveling for business. A patchwork of rules dictate how much time business travelers can spend in the state before they start owing tax. It can be as little as one day to as many as 60 days, with the amount of tax owed generally proportional to the amount of time spent in the state. Some states specify that these income taxes are triggered once you earn over a certain amount of income. Regardless, it's a silly use of time for employees and employers to be calculating to ensure they're in compliance. And as I've said many times, New York loves creating waste of time. A more realistic solution from a group called the Mobile Workforce Coalition is to establish a standard for all states that say you can only tax workers if they're physically present in your state. And to avoid the business travel chaos, it would establish a 30-day threshold for all states. Therefore, only if you're physically in a state for more than 30 days would you be on the hook for the state's income taxes. And this comes back to what Eli the computer guy has said, and it's one of the reasons that I've genuinely enjoyed his channel over the past 12 years. He goes over a lot of the practical aspects of running a business, but also how business owners and how C-suite executives actually think. Many people think that C-suite executives only think based on low tax versus high tax, low licensing fees versus high licensing fees, complex regulatory environment versus simple regulatory environment. And that's not necessarily the case. At the end of the day, it's not about whether the fees are high taxes are high or they're low. It's about them being consistent. When you have a city that decides that they are going to change the Department of Consumer Affairs license code to the point where they can fine you for not having a license number on a receipt 
or on a business card, they have a 600 page code manual and that manual changes. They do not tell you that this very important thing changes. And then they send an inspector out to every single business to find the people that did not read the 600 page manual to figure out that there was something new this year versus three years ago when they got their license. That sucks when you have a cop come into your store to explain how to use the Leads Online system, who explicitly says you do not have to use this system when a customer recycles a laptop in your store if you have a record of it, and then an inspector comes in several years later to say that you actually do, and then tries to fine you, and if you fight that fine, you may be liable for up to $15,000, that sucks. And when you are told that these items are sales taxable and these items are not, but then you go into an audit where they ask you for almost a million dollars because they say, oh, whoops, my bad, that stuff actually is sales taxable, you have to fight it for a year, that sucks. Many people think that the reason that I move my business to Texas is so that I could pay less taxes. And that could not be more wrong. I moved to Texas because I want to know what I actually pay. I don't mind if the tax is high or low. I mind not knowing ahead of time what it is that is expected of me. I mind living in this weird environment where it's so kind of vague and confusing and changing that you never really know if you're obeying the law or not and you never really know what you owe. I don't mind if the sales tax is 20% versus 5%. What I mind is not knowing what is or is not sales taxable outside of a year and a half long audit. I mind not knowing if I am obeying the law or disobeying the law because it changes so often and sometimes dare I say it is done on purpose and I'm going to go over why that is in the next video. And we're going to be going over why it is that they're clamping down on stuff like this and making it obscure and confusing seemingly on purpose at this particular point in time versus another. So if you're getting close to the end of this video, that's right folks, don't touch that dial. And if you know who made that song or that album, well, you are truly a person of culture. At, but genuinely, you need to know what the regulatory environment is. The more complex you make it, the more likely people are to leave. People who run businesses do calculations. We'll look and say, Miami has 400,000 people, Austin has 800,000 people, New York is like 8.2, 8.5 million. So even if the taxes are a little bit higher, even if the licensing costs are a little bit higher, you have 10 times the customer base, we can have 10 times the business, we can raise our price a little bit as a result of that, therefore we will be okay. Businesses will always find a way to adapt to an environment. The point at which you will genuinely start to lose businesses is when they don't know how to adapt to your environment because it's such a mess that it is impossible to adapt to. It is not about tax evasion. It is not about wanting to not pay as much in licensing fees or everything else. It's literally about not knowing what it is you are supposed to pay and being put in a position where you can be dinged or fined at any given moment or hit with a standard auto form because you literally have to keep track of every single day that you spend in the city or the state in order to avoid being taxed twice when you should just be taxed once. Lastly, before I end the video, there's one thing that I'd like to go over here because I see it in the comments from time to time and I do think it is worth addressing. There are people that will use the phrase, New York lives, quote, rent free in your head. I've always found this to be a particularly manipulative statement because what it does, what they're really saying is if you have been screwed over in some way, shape or form and you tell others about that so that they may avoid the same screw job or if you wish to try and push towards some sort of positive change in society, that that is something worthy of being mocked for, made fun of. Don't talk about your experience. And if you've looked at the history of this channel over the past 10 years, whether we're talking about reseller ratings, trying to screw over businesses, and actually being happy to screw over businesses and brag about how they have people paying $7,000 a month when they used to pay $100 a month, or we're talking about Apple and ICE keeping repair shops from being able to import parts to be able to fix consumer electronics and trying to destroy the repair industry in general. One of the main themes of this channel has always been discussing when I think there is a bully that is screwing somebody over or when something is unfair. I think that is important in order to push towards positive change in society. When you have a state that tries to take more than my entire net worth and destroy my way of life, my business, and my income, I think it's kind of worth talking about from time to time. If you had a roommate that would take a crap on the floor, pick up the crap, and then plaster it on your walls, you may tell your friend before that person decides that they are going to go on a vacation together or rent a space together. And if you go on a Tinder date and the guy tries to tie you up in his car on the first date and you notice that your friend swiped right in the same person and matched, you may tell them before they walk into the same mess, the same way that I would like other businesses in New York State to understand what's going on so that they can make their own choices. If you wish to watch this content, if you wish to watch the type of content that I've made over the past 10 years, I'm happy that you're a viewer. If you don't like me talking about this type of stuff, then unsubscribe. I've been making the same type of content for 10 years. I'm not going to change the style of my content. I'm not going to change the style of my commentary. 
because you don't like it. If this type of content means that we may push towards positive change, if this means that we may push towards a world where you don't have double taxation, where businesses have more proper regulatory environments, where they actually know what the laws are, if we move towards a world where Google uses multiple websites to determine the reputation of a business rather than just one like reseller ratings, or we move towards a world where you do not get in trouble for importing parts to fix consumer electronics, I'm a happy guy. This has been my content for over 10 years. I discuss what matters to me, and I try to push towards positive change. If you don't like that type of content, I don't know what channel you thought you subscribed to, but you're always welcome to unsubscribe. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.